The malice in Dallas took place in 1992 during a legal battle between Southwest Airlines and Stevens Aviation. The two companies were engaged in a dispute over the phrase, just plain smart, which Stevens Aviation claimed was too similar to their own slogan, plain smart. Instead of resorting to a lengthy and costly legal process, Kelleher proposed a more unconventional solution to settle the manner. In a display of humor and a commitment to resolve conflicts amicably, Kelleher suggested that the CEOs of both companies participate in an arm wrestling match. The winner would get to use the contested slogan. The event was dubbed the Malice in Dallas, a playful reference to the famous boxing match, the Thrilla in Manila, between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier. The media-covered event took place in the Dallas Hotel Ballroom, with Kelleher himself serving as the referee. The CEO's arm wrestled, and Kelleher declared a winner. In the end, Southwest Airlines emerged victorious, and both companies dropped their legal actions. The unconventional resolution demonstrated Kelleher's wit, creativity, and a willingness to think outside of the box to resolve disputes. It's also become emblematic of his leadership style, showcasing his commitment to a fun and unconventional corporate culture. It also highlighted his belief in finding creative and humorous humorous solutions to its challenges, even in the often serious world of business and legal disputes. It symbolized also his commitment to settling disputes in a lighthearted and unconventional manner. And with that, welcome back to Leaders, a podcast dedicated to exploring the best leaders this world has ever seen. And today's episode, episode 25, will cover the founder and C- and former CEO of Southwest Airlines, Herb Kelleher, uh, one person who had a rare feat, especially with an airline, of having 47 years of par- straight years of profit. Uh, and he describes his company as a service company that just happens to fly airplanes. So within that initial story, as well as some of the other things that we will cover here uh, on Herb, he has a great leadership style that should be studied further. And we will go into now what he describes and a lot of different quotes that we've collected as far as different topics and certain philosophies that he believes are key when leading a company. And so to start off, I think three words that describe him in a good manner would be nimble, quick, and opportunistic. He does mention uh, being within the business itself. So we've seen this with Jim Senegal, um, with a few of these other Ray Kroc, uh, a few other leaders in which they are in the business, they are in the details, Elon Musk comes to mind too, being on the factory floor. Uh, Herb definitely embodies that as well. He also does say to s- spend more time with your people and less time with other CEOs. So definitely company-centric, understanding the problems and uh, people of Southwest Airlines. And so he says to support the strategy, the company determined to fly only one type of airplane, the Boeing 737, and to substitute linear flying for the hub and spoke model that has prevailed in the industry. But at the center of Southwest success are its culture and employees. And so the key to his success was leveraging the human trait of reciprocation to the maximum extent possible. And he built a cultural flywheel that his competitors couldn't match. He shared the spoils with his employees. And in the process, he built America's most successful airline. So now we're going to go into a few different topics in which he has quotes on and kind of reflecting his beliefs on each one. So the first one being tone at the top. So he says, I also think leadership by example is very important. Southwest has never had any disputes over our executives being paid too much because, quite frankly, we've always made sure they were underpaid. We're not afraid to show our people that we're not in it for ourselves. Let me give you an example. We negotiated a contract with our pilots in which they took a five-year pay freeze in return for getting stock options. 
Well, it wasn't part of the deal, but I immediately took a five-year pay freeze. I have turned down many, many millions of dollars in salary and options because it didn't set a good example. Our officers have never received a salary increase that is larger on average than our non-contract employees have gotten. In other words, if they got a 3.5% increase, our officers get a 3.5% increase. We've always done that. So it definitely speaks to him as a people person and servant leadership. And he does go on to also say it's about the people. So he says the business of business is people. And also says, I think the values of Southwest are humanism, number one. I think simplicity, number two. Humor, number three. Service altruism, number four. I think that pretty mo well sums it up. So four values of Southwest. We have a people department. That's what it deals with, so we so don't call it human resources. That sounds like something from a Stalin five-year plan. You know, how much coal can you mine? And this people-centric focus, he says to later go on and say, value people and leverage that reciprocation. So he says, if you don't treat your own people well, they won't treat other people well. He's always felt that his people came first. Some of the business schools regarded that as a conundrum. They would say, which comes first, your people, your customers, or your shareholders? And I would say, it's not a conundrum. Your people come first, and if you treat them right, they'll treat the customers right, and the customers will come back, and that'll make the shareholders happy. He also focuses on employees as people. We want them to know that they're important to us, not just because they're at work, like they were cogs in a machine. So we pay a lot of attention to their personal lives, the griefs, the joys that, they're, that they experience. We recognize those if they're seriously ill. We communicate with them. We send them care packages. We want them to know that we value them as individuals, not as part of a workplace. At Southwest, you can't have a baby without being recognized, getting communication from the general office. You can't have a death in your family without hearing from us. If you're out with a serious illness, we're in touch with you once every two weeks to see how you're doing. We have people who have been retired for 10 years, and we keep in touch with them. We want them to know that we value them as individuals, not just as workers. So that's part of the Espirit de Corps. We used to have a corporate day. Companies would come in from around the world and they were interested in how we hired, trained, that sort of thing. Then we'd say, treat your people well and they'll treat you well. And then they go home disappointed. It was too simple. So it's clear Herb is taking this people concept to another level uh, of some of the other companies that we've studied, which definitely do have some sort of level of people focus, but he's taking this, it seems as though, to an extreme. He does go on to say as well, we did have a different take to competitors as a matter of fact, and that was the employees come first. Employees first, customer second, shareholders third. If the employees serve the customer well, the customer comes back, and that's what makes the shareholders happy. It's simple. It's not a conflict. It's a chain. If you treated the employees well, if you cared for them, if you value them as in people, if you give gave them psychic sa satisfaction in their jobs, that they would really do a great job for the customers, and the customers would come back, which would be great, good for the shareholders. Most companies didn't operate that way. So we turned the pyramid upside down, in effect, and said the employees come first, and they always have, not just in our minds, but in our hearts as well. Reading a book currently on Charlie Munger uh, philosophies, and he always does say to always invert, invert. And in this case, uh, Herb is looking at this a little bit upside down in saying that, no, the shareholder is not the most important, but the people and the uh, customers uh, follow in between that priority. He says, he goes on to say, we're perfectly happy with having, generally speaking, the highest pay for employees in the domestic industry. They reward us with tremendous productivity, which lessens the effect. And the other airlines disadvantage their people. I'm not saying they didn't have to in the sense of either we do this or we fail. So it's not a criticism. I'm just talking about the economic effects of it. We teach each of our managers to sit down at least once a week with all the people who work for them. 
So if they have any suggestions, they can make them in person. So definitely a focus on people, also empowering people. And he goes on to say, if you create an environment where the people truly participate, you don't need control. They know what needs to be done and they do it. And the more that people will devote themselves to your cause on a voluntary basis, a willing basis, the fewer hierarchies and control mechanisms you need. He also does say provide guidelines only, not rules. Give your employees the flexibility to make decisions on the spot. In dealing with people, you also are dealing with some challenges that go along the way. And so he describes some of these situations as win-win. So he says, we're the most unionized airline in the industry, and we've never treated the labor unions as adversaries. We've always treated them as partners. And as you see in, in a past episode, we covered Mary Barra, uh, definitely some challenges within the auto industry with unions, uh, a little bit different from an airline perspective, but definitely a challenge to deal with as a CEO and leader of um, the employees and unionization. Because, and then he goes on to say, because if the canoe goes down, we are going to go down with it. I don't mean that in a perfunctory, superficial way. We hold company events. We invite all the labor union leaders to come to them as they are part of the company too. If they have an issue, we take care of it as quickly as we can. Being very cognizant of their needs and they reciprocate. They respond to that very, very well. This also uh, goes back to episode one, I think, in Costco, Jim, Jim Senegal. And there was recently a letter that was released uh, for Costco and... It was just a great response uh, from Craig Jelinek, who has followed Jim as CEO, and it was just a response to uh, unionization amongst a store in Virginia. Um, So definitely a similar philosophy to responding to that um, and not ignoring it or being adversarial in nature with with those sort of arrangements. It is interesting to see those parallels. And one other person is Carolyn Corvey. She's a VP GM of Boeing 737-757. And what she had to say was, our relationship with Southwest is about more than just delivering great airplanes. It's about understanding their business, trusting each other, and working together to achieve solutions. We know that while they have a lot of fun and play hard, they also run a business model that the entire industry emulates and admires. We are delighted and honored to have such a wonderful partner. Partners, people, uh, a lot of the within people too is that you have to hire the right people to entrust and empower them. And so Herb says we spend a lot of time trying to hire employees who have a customer service focus and are altruistic. At Southwest Airlines, he says, we value education and experience, but we would rather have somebody with less education and experience, but with a great attitude. If it comes down to a choice between the two, we'll take the attitude over the education and experience and provide those ourselves. We also dedicate an enormous amount of time to making sure we get people who are other-oriented, who have a servant's heart, who enjoy working as part of the team. Bad attitudes metastasize throughout your organization, no matter where they are located. So a good attitude, they're hiring for someone who is altruistic and customer service focused. We also do see, as we alluded to earlier, that Herb has a focus on spending time in the field in which he is in, which is in the airline industry. So He was often seen out on the tarmac unloading and loading bags, doing those kind of daily uh, sort of tasks that other employees may do. He also does say on this topic that we think that our management ought to spend time with customers in the field, sampling what our employees and customers experience every day. So we have a requirement that each of our officers each quarter goes out into the field to act as a reservations agent to load baggage to dispatch airplanes or whatever is required and report back to me on what they did what they found out and what they did to improve the job 
So a people first sort of quality and philosophy there, which then I think also does bleed into what is Southwest's culture. So he thinks culture is also key. And he has a few comments on this topic as well. He says, we, we don't just have a central cultural committee. We have one at each facility across the country. I think we've been pretty successful in going from 198 people to 35,000 and keeping the Spirit de Corps alive. At many other companies, they give up as they get bigger. They say, we're so big now that we can't keep this jeu de vivir, this effervescence in our company. We've always said it's the most important thing we have, and we're going to do everything that's needed to maintain it. They were a little concerned as they got bigger that maybe some of early culture might be lost. So we set up this culture committee whose only purpose is to keep its culture alive. Before people knew how to make fire, there's a fire watcher. Cave dwellers may have found a tree hit by lightning and brought fire back to the cave. Somebody had to make sure it kept going because if it went out, there was no telling when another tree would be hit by lightning. And so the fire watcher was the most important person in the tribe. I sold, I said to our culture committee, you are our fire watchers who make sure the fire does not go out. I think you're our most important committee at Southwest. Finally, one other one is <clears throat> we decided that we had to institute another limitation on expansion. One which is cultural in nature. We simply cannot increase our staff 10% per year and expect to maintain the same, same kind of environment and culture we have, and that is important to us. So scaling responsibly, maintaining that culture. He does believe that this culture has, to an extent, a competitive advantage. And he says, I think... The difficulty for them, competitors, is the cultural aspect of it. That cannot be duplicated. One of the things that demonstrates the power of people is when the United Shuttle took out after us in Oakland. They had all the advantages. I mean, they had first-class seats for those who don't want to fly anything but first-class. They had a global frequent flyer program, which we did not have. They probably spent 25 or $30 million on their ad campaign. I probably have something like a thousand letters at my office that tell you why they finally receded from Oakland. Those letters say, Herb, I tried them, but I just like your people more, so I'm back. Don't ever doubt in the customer service business the importance of people and their attitudes. He also says, one thing I tell our people is that the intangibles are much more important than the tangibles because anybody can buy the intangibles, but nobody can replicate the intangibles very easily. And I'm talking about the spirit of the people. The intangibles are far more important than the tangibles because obviously you can replicate the tangibles. You can get the same airplane. You can get the same ticket counters. You can get the same computers. But the hardest thing for a competitor to match is your culture and the spirit of your people and their focus on customer service because that isn't something you can do overnight and it isn't something that you can do without a great deal of attention every day in a thousand different ways. This is what, why I can say our employees are our competitive protection we basically said to our people, there are three things that we're interested in. The lowest cost in the industry, that can't hurt you having the lowest cost. The best customer service, that's a very important element of value. We said beyond that, we're interested in tangibles, a spiritual infusion, because they are the hardest things for your competitors to replicate. The tangible things your competitors can go out and buy, but they can't buy your spirit. So it's the most powerful thing of all. He also doesn't believe really in a sort of master plan. So he says he's never done the long range planning that is customary in many businesses. This is uh, similar, I think, to Jensen Huang on episode 20. NVIDIA doesn't really believe in the idea of like a five year plan. It's kind of a constant um, uh, evolvement and evolution of what you're doing right now. 
that informs the future. So he says, Herb, when planning becomes big in the airline community, one of the analysts came up to me and said, Herb, I understand you don't have a plan. I said that we have the most unusual plan in the industry, doing things. That's our plan. What we do by way of strategic planning is we define ourselves and then we redefine ourselves. So part of uh, the plan and doing things is innovation. So innovate, change, he believes in that and he has some quotes on that as well. We tell our people all the time, you have to be ready for change. In fact, sometimes only in change is there security. I don't want our people to be afraid of change. I want them to welcome change. Substantive change for good reasons. Change is something that is that has always transpired at Southwest. You don't change your principles or your philosophy, but tactically you adjust to outside competition and forces. He does really attribute his success and Southwest's success to his historicity, a sense of futurity and innovative thinking. I think some of the critical elements are to remain outward looking, to preserve alacrity and to stay loose. He does encourage ideas for innovation. So on this topic, he says, foster a fluid exchange of ideas whereby everyone feels free to get the information they need without having to dig through multiple layers. Ideas should be able to easily circulate up, down, and around. I think that is in extremely important. In this scenario, paperwork is the enemy. Yes, you need it, but you constantly have to fight to keep the volume down and simplify the information so that people can understand it readily. I also believe you need to exalt the people who come up with new ideas. They must be thanked and toasted and lionized for the ideas they provided and which have been productive and constructive. They do have a rule at Southwest, and that is an employee can send an idea to anyone at any time. They convey it orally, put it in writing. It does not matter who it is. Responses are sent within one week. We want to show respect for the fact that they cared enough to submit that idea. In addition, a simple no is unacceptable. That is just an exercise of power and can be invoked every, very irrationally. If we say no to your idea, you're likely to receive a page and a half explaining exactly why we don't think it will work at this point in time. This process keeps ideas coming from people because they do not feel as if they have been spurned as a consequence of being ignored or just being told no. If you consistently turn, out, turn down ideas, you won't get any more. A venture capitalist can entertain 20 ideas for every one that eventuates into something worthwhile. So within the company, we try to do the same thing. Keep the ideas coming. Otherwise, you end up curtailing innovation. Herb says, also, you have to welcome new ideas and creativity. And you have to entertain a thousand ideas for every good one that you get. But if you start turning them down just to turn them down because you can't be bothered and don't have time, you never get a great one. I think you have to listen to people's ideas and you don't credential them because you can get a great idea from anyone, anywhere, no matter what they do or how much education they've had or what their background is because people's minds usually are working furiously. So it's important to listen to everyone that has an idea. And even if the idea is not perfect, it may be the kernel of a great development in it. So I'd say when it comes to ideas, keep your ears open so open to ideas innovative looking for ideas constantly within whoever wants to sort of come up with them within the company is a great philosophy as well and so he also does say to keep it simple we have been successful because we've had a simple strategy our people have bought into it. Our people fully understand it. We have had to have extreme discipline in not departing from the strategy. What we try to do is establish a clear and simple set of values that we understand. <clears throat> that simplifies things. That expedites things. It enables the extreme discipline I mentioned in describing our strategy. When an 
issue comes up, we don't say we're going to study it for two and a half years. We just say Southwest Airlines doesn't do that. Maybe somebody else does, but we don't. It greatly facilitates the operation of the company. A few others here, <coughs> not going to um, include lengthy quotes with them, but um, fundamental philosophies are and qualities are within humility, uh, not always maximizing short-term profit. And then maintaining smallness. So think small, act small, and we'll get bigger. Think big and act big, and we'll get smaller. Think also differently and help to grow the market. So um, focusing on those cost advantages, not getting um, too hung up on costs. How do you get low cost? Through a lot of things, including inspiration that you give your people, productivity, Focusing also on your core competencies. So he says, finally, another thing we decided as a matter of policy years ago that, that we wouldn't do anything that wasn't connected with the airline business. I guess what we were saying in a kind of a humble way was we don't know everything about everything. We know about one thing. I have seen other airlines make mistakes buying radio stations, hotel chains, rent, rental car businesses, and so on and so forth. And I thought, we don't want to get into thinking that we're almighty because we've done pretty well. And that's still the policy today. So some great um, leadership qualities there from Herb and some great quotes to go along with it. And we wouldn't be uh, remiss without also highlighting some of the failures that went along with Southwest becoming one of those dominant airlines of this U.S. industry. So while he is celebrated for all these successes, he did have some challenges and setbacks. Um, the ValueJet partnership. So in the nine mid nineteen nineties, they entered a low cost carrier called named AirTran. This venture faced operational and safety issues and a fatal crash in 1996 raised concerns about safety standards. He wasn't directly responsible for those operations, but that partnership faced criticism and challenges. Labor disputes, so we mentioned the union stuff, but then he was generally successful in maintaining positive relations with employees. There were instances of labor negotiations, conflicts, competitive pressures, so... Their success att attracted competition. Instances where they face challenges from other low-cost carriers could be intense, but they navigated through it, those periods. Fuel price fluctuations, so like many airlines, they are impacted by that. Sharp increases in cost can put a strain on their profitability. Managing that impact uh, is a common challenge. International expansion, they've had some challenges with too. So while they were primar primarily focused on domestic routes and started uh, within the cities, tri-city of Texas, it faced challenges when they tried to do that internationally. So they struggled with the international operations, faced hurdles in establishing successful sort of routes outside of the U.S. So a few uh, challenges we've seen there. And let's wrap this episode up with our last section of mentors and heroes. So uh, Herb, uh, as far as his mentors, mentions a few here. So Roland King was one of the other co-founders of Southwest. The idea originated from a conversation between them in a San Antonio hotel in 1966. And it was part of uh, King's vision and collaboration with Kelleher in terms of founding that airline. M. Lamar Muse, so he was an aviation ex executive, served as the president and CEO of Southwest before Herb. So he Herb succeeded him in 1981, but Muse's leadership and contributions to the early development of Southwest likely had an impact on Herb's understanding of the airline industry. Fred Smith, who is a founder and CEO of FedEx, known to also have an influence on him, the two were friends. Kelleher has mentioned his leadership style and approach to business as inspirational. They both share a focus on efficiency and innovation, so some parallels there. And then finally, within a mentor's Joan Robinson Kerr, 
So Kerr was an attorney and a close friend of Herb. She played a key role in helping them navigate legal challenges, including battles with other airlines and in regulatory hurdles. The Her expertise and advice were crucial during those kind of formative years. <clears throat> he does mention in passing, too, from a hero's standpoint, Winston Churchill often. He does mention also some other aviation pioneers, so a deep passion for aviation and admiring people like Orville and Wilbur Wright, and also some entrepreneurial icons. So while specific names may not be known, individuals like Walt Disney, Ray Kroc, Sam Walton transformed their industries as well. He does mention those legal minds leaders with unconventional approaches too so he definitely does have one where he has a sense of humor a uh, leadership style in which he's focusing on culture people that sort of thing so he po he admired uh, ones who challenged traditional norms people like maybe richard branson are known for their kind of unconventional and charismatic leadership style he definitely also did have a love for literature and philosophy so he drew inspiration likely from some thinkers and writers in that space. Maybe someone like Mark Twain, who he admired, may have influenced his approach to leadership and life as well. So with that, that should cover off on episode 25 here for Herb Kelleher, the co-founder and CEO, f former CEO of Southwest Airlines. Definitely an industry that is challenging to one really truly succeed in for a longer period of time but then two also an industry that probably is difficult to lead in as well as develop some kind of key principles that employees can really uh, resonate with as well as remain um, positive and have great satisfaction in working there so people culture doing the right thing innovation are definitely key kind of principles that he helped lead Southwest into great success for. So with that, that is the end of episode 25, and we will be back with episode 26 here shortly. Thanks.